So thank you so much for the invitation to speak to you tonight. And uh, you already have a preview about what I'm going to be speaking about. I'm really excited to know that there's so many people in the room with diverse interests. Um, I heard that there's a few planners in the room. So I'm going to be presenting a framework that's really uh, foundational and, and quite prominent in, in the urban planning field, but where I think there are, is a lot of relevance and a lot of important insights to be brought to bear uh, in civic technology. So I'm hoping we can have a conversation that uh, brings some of those threads together tonight. Oh dear. Okay, and I'm having trouble advancing the slide. Um, it looks like John's going to come and help me out here. Um, my presentation is really divided into two parts. I'm going to start with a talk, and we're going to move into a co-design workshop component. And as you've already had a little bit of an orientation to, um, I'm a professor at, at Brock University, and the co-design part of today's workshop I'm going to ask for you to share stories, if you have them, about any ideas or insights that are relevant to the participation ladder that I present, and for you to fill them out um, on this handout. And um, with some help from some audience members, I'm hoping we can get this ladder, the paper model, up on the windows or somewhere that's appropriate, and um, <laughs> we can map some of those stories um, right on the wall. And this is very much inspired by paper prototyping and low fidelity methods from the human-centered design field. In terms of Arnstein's ladder, um, it really comes from a paper that was published in 1969 in the Journal of the American Institute of Planners. And for me, this is one set of ideas that really um, I come back to again and again, because it's really changed how I think about things. So this ladder, this model of participation, uh, from 1969 publication, we can situate this within the context of the civil rights movement in the United States. Uh, the civil rights movement in the 50s and the 60s um, is, is at the tail end of, of when this was published in 69. At the same time period, in Paris in 1968, there are very well-known protests where students and union workers came together to try and imagine a new possibility for, for what civic life could be. So these are some of the kinds of events that would have been influencing Sherry Arnstein in 1969 when she published this really, really important and, and much cited paper. Now at the same time, um, it's important to realize that this paper came out of the urban planning field and one of the main influences um, of Sherry Arnstein's model a lot of the examples that she gives that she maps to the model, they relate to poverty reduction ideas uh, that were in place in the late 1960s and the idea that instead of just having government decide how poverty reduction dollars would be spent, that that would be shared with the citizens and people who were affected directly by poverty would become participants, that be, they become uh, citizen delegates in terms of deciding what would happen with some of those governmental funds. So Arnstein's work is situated within this particular context, but um, there's, there's many hopes, and Arnstein also writes, that she imagines that the latter could be used in different contexts. What I'm proposing tonight is that we try and imagine how we could use Arnstein's ladder to contextualize or explain some of the things that happen in the civic technology community. So how Arnstein opens her paper uh, is with a little bit of a metaphor around spinach. So she explains to us that everyone agrees, virtually everyone agrees, that spinach is good for you. And participation is a little bit like eating spinach. Many people will agree that we should have participation, that it's something we should strive for, but actually how to enact it in a meaningful way is really, really difficult. I think we're at a moment where we can replace the word participation with openness. How we enact openness, although we may agree, many of us may agree that it's important and democratically significant, what we actually do to build it and instantiate it uh, differs, different communities and different contexts. And while we might all agree it's a good thing, what it actually means is pretty radically <coughs> different in different situations. So that brings us to Arnstein's participation ladder. 
Um, so this particular uh, graphic of, of, the, of the model, it comes from the Vancouver Community Network. Um, and it's, it's very true to Arnstein's original uh, depiction of the, of the model. And there's three main tiers of these rungs. At the bottom, we see that there's uh, non-participation rungs, really where there aren't meaningful opportunities for citizens to get involved, even though they might be called participation. In the middle, we see rungs that are quite tokenistic in how they enact or instantiate participation. We see things like informing, consultation, and placation of citizens, but where that meaningful change doesn't happen through the activities that are being uh, carried out. At the top of the ladder, we see the most robust forms of participation that Arnstein uh, presents to us. And she describes those as being about citizen control and the kinds of cases and places where citizens can really make change through what they're doing. And if we think back to when Sherry Arnstein was writing about this participation ladder, I think it's really important to keep in mind that this was, you know, in the late 1960s, civil rights movement had been in full swing in the United States. There were major policy programs to try and deal with poverty that was occurring around the country. And what Sherry Arnstein had to say about participation is that participation without redistribution of power is an empty and frustrating process for the powerless. So I'd ask that you keep that kind of idea in mind about situations, cases, and places where we're actually shifting who holds the power and um, how it's carried out in the world. So this is a time uh, where you might start to have some ideas percolating in your brain about some connections to civic technology. That could be hackathons you've participated in, your attempts to get open data sets, your attempts to collaborate with someone who's differently situated from yourself, perhaps a government official, perhaps a citizen, perhaps someone from a nonprofit organization. Different ideas might be percolating about cases or instances where um, participation has been weak or strong, depending where it may be on the ladder. So I'm going to share a few of my experiences that relate to uh, the participation ladder and situate how and why I draw these connections. So from the bottom of the ladder, those non-participation examples, Arnstein writes that manipulation is often about when there's a tr an attempt to educate the public or engineer their support for something in a way that isn't genuine. It can also be rubber stamping or just really uh, advisory positions without a real club. Therapy is about experts trying to cure citizens of their pathology rather than changing the racism and victimization which occurs in society. And once again, thinking to the civil rights context um, that, that is close to the time period of this, I think is really important. So one case um, of my involvement in civic technology, which I mapped the latter, um, relates to um, an experience I have from about 2005. In 2005, I was doing a research project in the waiting room of a community health center in Vancouver, and citizens had the opportunity to look up health information provided by government before they went into their medical appointment. But um, what happens, if we click, is um, citizens, they had to log in using their BC or Yukon postal code. And um, what that resulted in was a situation where there was a barrier to entry to the website. And a real non-participation uh, was enacted in many cases because if someone was not stably housed and they didn't have a postal code, it was incredibly difficult to even gain entry into the site. And um, as a researcher in the waiting room of the clinic, I observed the discomfort, the lack of belonging that people felt when they were presented with this postal code field that they couldn't comply with. So another kind of experience that I have that relates to the civic technology community that I mapped the latter is around tokenism. So these are the examples that we talked about where there might be places and spaces for citizens to participate, but they aren't as robust as we might aspire towards. They aren't as, as great as we hope that they could be. So um, consultation is one of the areas here, and consultation is a really um, loved and hated avenue for citizens to get involved. 
What Sherry Arnstein tells us is that sometimes consultation is a sham because there's no assurance that citizen concerns and ideas will be taken into account. And um, it can be really difficult to run a consultation, to analyze all of the feedback, and to use that in ways that really shape the policy or the decisions with all of the other constraints and, and dimensions which have to be brought to bear. Um, one case that's civic technology related, where I've had experiences that I would describe as a little bit tokenistic in terms of my participation in the consultation. Um, around 2008, the government of Ontario was enacting a bill called the Photocard Act, and they were creating enhanced driver's licenses, meaning that you could get a driver's license from that point forward with a radio frequency identification chip and uh, with uh, biometric identifiers and to use that as a border crossing document. So as the bill that was associated with those enhanced driver's licenses went through the legislature in Ontario, uh, there was a possibility for interested parties to participate in public hearings that were held at the legislature in a committee room. And um, one of my colleagues, Andrew Clement, um, shared a number of our research team's concerns about um, the privacy risks of enhanced driver's licenses, um, issues uh, such as the possibility of the skimming of, of the cards or uh, also the possibility of shadow databases being constructed. And he verbalized a lot of those concerns. Um, in a parallel process, we were also acquiring a lot of equipment to try and make a technical demonstration to show those privacy concerns with the enhanced driver's license. And we got a lot of the equipment that would be used at a border crossing, like a reader, an antenna, uh, the database system that would work with the cards. And we created a mock system using the same equipment that you see if you go to Buffalo or you cross the border. Um, and really what a frustration for us was at this point was we couldn't get the equipment in a timely enough manner to have the demonstration ready as the policy making process was unfolding. And we believe that was because essentially a lot of the equipment was on back order because border states and provinces had already um, acquired or were purchasing this stuff. And it was difficult to get our hands on it, to build a demonstration, to really test how things would work and to demonstrate those concerns. Um, we, we fared okay, we did have it ready, but not quite at the right moment in terms of the policy cycle. Um, we did make a mock database that demonstrated some of the possibilities of assigning risk levels and riskiness uh, to citizens and mock driver's licenses that we tied those cards to. Um, a final example that I'd like to share um, that, uh, that I map from my own civic technology experiences to Arnstein's ladder is around citizen control. So as, as we described, this is really the part where that power shift happens where instead of the people who already have power maintaining it and keeping it, it gets shared with a broader array of people and ideally uh, individuals in society who are have-nots or who might not have as much access to that power and privilege. So um, an example that I have that I think really demonstrates some of the citizen control, I've been an active participant in open source and open technology communities for a number of years. I see some optimistic possibilities in these communities uh, for citizens to really get involved and enact change through what they design uh, in these spaces. But there's one practice that I'd like to highlight that um, came from the Adacamp conference, which I attended in 2015. So Adacamp is uh, a feminist unconference. And um, it, it's not currently having more inst instances of the conference, unfortunately. Um, but the idea was to create a space um, for, for women in particular uh, to really have a space to participate in open technology communities. And one practice which unfolded at, at Ada Camp when I was there was they provided lanyards for the participants that were color coded and that also had um, basically symbols on them so that if someone was visually impaired and couldn't discern the colors, there was still a way to tell the difference between the different lanyards. And the lanyards were all about signaling whether it was okay to take someone's photo at the event. So if you had a green lanyard, that meant take my photo, I'm okay with it, 
go for it. If you had a yellow lanyard, it meant ask first. I want you to get my permission before you take my photo. And the red lanyard meant don't take a photo, don't even ask, it's not going to be okay with me. And for me, this was an example of a particular practice in an open technology community where a lot of the usual norms were disrupted. And the possibility to do things differently, uh, perhaps because some of the participants had experienced harassment or um, it might not be safe to have their identity shared online as being at a conference on a particular day, the practices were changed to make it a safer space for those in attendance. So I'm hoping that these examples have traced and have really illustrated